everyone. I'm Sahana. And I'm Ahana. And we're back with another episode as a part of the League of Eminence series. In this series, we talk to highly distinguished Bits and Alim and explore their journey through Bits and also take a look at how it all transformed since then. Today, we bring to you someone who was a Bitsian star kid through and through, starting with being a high school topper in the whole of Rajasthan to a gold medalist at Bits Pilani and eventually winning the Bitsa Distinguished Alumni Award for his entire career. Most of the world knew of his incredible contributions in the field of semiconductors and material sciences. And he was also a recipient of the prestigious IEEE Andrew S. Grove Award. But today, we also got to see the simple, dedicated, and warm side of this wonderful human being. So let's welcome Professor Krishna Saraswat, head of the Tripoli Department at Stanford University, batch of 1963, Bits Pilani. are very rhyming with each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, well, it's so nice to see young entrepreneurs like you, uh, uh, Doing this, uh, it's fantastic. I'm, I'm really pleased. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Great. So without further ado, let's just get to the interview. Um, let's start from the very beginning, like your roots. Um, right from the beginning, you know, uh, before your college days. So we read that um, you'd initially, uh, you know, applied to the IITs, but they refused to admit you because you were just four months short of the minimum age limit. <laughs> But this... It's a little, little bit uh, uh, longer story. I was born and brought up in Pilani. My father was a professor uh, in the then Birla College of Science. You know, before BITS came, there were independent colleges run by Birlas. <clears throat> uh -huh. And uh, I was the gold medalist in the entire Rajasthan in the higher secondary exam. <clears throat> uh, so... IITs were in their infancy at the time. Pilani was a much older institution. It came during the Second World War, actually. I see. Uh, and Pil Pilani was very famous. Uh, bec because my age was short, IITs did not even send me the admission form. Oh. So, so uh, that, that's okay. I didn't really mind it that much at the time. Uh, uh, bits uh, 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 was very accommodating. In fact, my predecessor, his name was Bimal Mathur. Okay. He was also a medalist from Rajasthan, and he chose to stay in Nepilani. Uh, so I followed his footsteps, and I was glad I stayed in Pilani because, because of my gold medal in uh, higher secondary examination, I was regarded as the best. So I didn't have to work very hard during my student days. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, you know, uh, IIT Delhi was not even uh, there at the time. Okay. It came, I think, uh, in the second or the third year of my stay in Pilani. So I was so glad I stayed in Pilani. So did my uh, family, my father and my brothers, etc. Right. So. Right. And how about electronics engineering? Like, how, did you stumble upon it or were you always passionate about it? Actually, I was more passionate about physics. That was my first yeah. choice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, what happened was, uh, my father was a fairly famous scientist at the time. He did some discoveries. Uh, he was a biologist. Okay. So based on his discoveries, uh, he was invited to come to USA as a visiting uh, professor at the University of Illinois. Mm -hmm. And he saw that electronics was an up and coming thing. So he said, forget about physics. You do physics, you will end up being a teacher just like uh, me. <laughs> well, I said, he said, take electronics because that's the application of physics. Okay. Well, decades after, here I am a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> but interestingly, Bimal Mathur, who was my predecessor the previous year, also uh, uh, um, uh, a gold medalist, uh, also chose electronics. So did Rajkumar Gera, who was the silver medalist in my batch in Rajasthan. So 
by then it was recognized that up and coming area was electronics by few people and i'm glad we uh, all three of us chose to do that mm -hmm. so it was not just a, a fluke i chose it uh, intentionally that so it's almost like science was running in your genes in some sense given that your father <laughs> <laughs> and that's you true yeah took to research eventually i mean we often find this now that we've just stepped out of college that our lives end up mirroring that of our parents more than we like it to like we don't do it intentionally <laughs> but it just ends up <laughs> for some for some weird reason it uh, rubs on you yeah uh, my father had a pretty difficult life his father was a school teacher so uh, he was actually lured to pilani from up he grew up uh, uh, in agra uh -huh. and he was teaching in a junior college in uh, nanital near nanital okay. so pilani was trying to attract people but who would go to pilani during 40s the nearest railway station was something like 40 miles away and you had to go to pilani on the camel back or something but they promised him that hey we will make you a faculty member and you can do a phd <laughs> so lock stock and barrel he took the entire family <laughs> moved to pilani and he was the first phd of university of rajasthan remember pilani colleges were under university of rajasthan at the time okay. so that's how uh, that's the story of my origin i was born and brought up in pilani nice yeah. how would you describe yourself as a student at wits like what would some of the hobbies or clubs that you did and pursued there so the, uh, the clubs is a more recent uh, story there were not that many or there were no clubs at the time okay uh so my hobbies were uh, so i was not a good athlete so i could not be in any of the sporting teams but i used to play uh, cricket and uh, hockey okay so for cricket my best friend was a cricket captain i used to let him uh, copy my homework and what not and he would let me the 12th man uh, <laughs> <laughs> sitting by his side his name is santi krishna rao he is now in uh, washington dc okay <laughs> so uh, but but uh, my your uh, question was also hobbies etc or projects so my dad brought a transistor radio from usa but my brothers wouldn't let me touch it they said no 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 tum usko tod doge so uh, i assembled my own radio of course it was a vacuum tube radio at the time but i assembled my own radio uh, later with rajkumar gera Uh, we uh, assembled a signal analyzer uh, to analyze various signals uh, in any electronic environment okay. so my hobbies were actually more along those lines uh, there were no clubs at the time right i was right. also very interested in photography right. so i i used to develop my own films uh, print uh, the, the the films those days there were no electronic cameras uh so i had a 35 mm camera uh mm -hmm. developing the film printing the the photos etc that was my uh, another hobby wow no yeah, that's very interesting <laughs> and was there any professor in bits cuz uh, who was your favorite and who actually inspired you to take up research later on so the inspiration came from my father again he was as i told you the first phd from university of rajasthan mm -hmm. and uh, he the, he's the one who uh, discovered that the heart of the frog has four chambers just like humans mm -hmm. and published papers and since then frogs are uh, used in biology for uh, uh, doing all the dissection and so on okay. but another person who really inspired me was not really well in uh, well within bits it was uh, dr choudhury he was the chair of the electronics department it was at that time known as telecommunications mm -hmm. he was a very good teacher but uh, but the director of siri okay was dr amarjit singh and he is the one who also inspired me 
quite a bit uh, about the area of electronics. Uh, he still re is alive and a very good friend and, and a role model for me. Okay. Yeah. So did you do internships uh, during your college time at Siri, for example? I did an internship in Siri, yes. Uh, we were required to have every summer, uh, we were required to go for internship. Mm -hmm. uh, so the uh, BS program was a five-year program at that time okay. and three of the years you had to do uh, internship so I, I did internship at CD Pilani yes nice. okay and moving on like in your final year what made you take the step to eventually then go abroad and join Stanford because I suppose at that time this was not a very popular choice and having spent your entire childhood and your college days in Pilani to then <laughs> take the step to go abroad how did that come about so in those days there was no computer yes. no internet no tv uh, uh, so the only information you could get was from the textbooks, the periodicals, the magazines, uh, technical magazines used to come by sea mail. So it would be at least a year or two late before they appeared in the library. Uh -huh. But yeah. several of my textbooks were from Stanford authors. For example, inventor of the transistor, William Shockley, mm -hmm. who uh, had won the Nobel Prize for that along with Britton and Bardeen. Inventor of solar cell, Gerald Pearson, both of them had just moved from Bell Labs to Stanford. So did uh, Linus Pauling, the winner of two Nobel Prizes, one in chemistry and one in peace. So the impression of Stanford was so great on me that these great people uh, are teaching at uh, Stanford. I need to go to Stanford. And my father had visited uh, <clears throat> this area and he, he said, well, if you go to Illinois, which is where he had spent a couple of years. He said, there is nothing but uh, uh, cornfields. <laughs> Boston, MIT had a collaboration with uh, 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 Pilani at that time, but Boston was very cold and I didn't really want to go to a cold place. <clears throat> okay. Few, very few people, were choosing to go to USA at the time. Mm -hmm. Getting a visa, uh, a permanent visa or immigration, a green card was very difficult. So, so the only way to come was as a student. Mm -hmm. And very few people were here. The total number of Indians in the entire Northern California was about 450. There were no Indian stores, yeah. no Indian restaurants, Indian influx started in mid 70s when I, I believe it was uh, Johnson who changed the, uh, the, the rules of immigration and allowed people to immigrate mm -hmm. uh, from various countries, including India. Mm -hmm. So that's when the influx started. So that's uh, the story of mm -hmm. uh, Indians in this area uh, and, and my choice, as I told you earlier. Right. 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 So we've learned so far about how your journey started and where it all began. So now we would like to know a little bit more about, you know, how the journey of pioneer, you know, you becoming a pioneer researcher started off. So we learned that you've also worked at Texas Instruments briefly uh, before, you know, after a master's and a PhD. So in how did that uh, stint like how did that reinforce your idea of going back into PhD or how 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 was that experience? So when I started my master's program, it was a disaster. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I took uh, the very first quarter. Stanford is on a quarter system, mm -hmm. a three month long quarter. So I I chose five courses, which was a pretty heavy load. Okay including a course in quantum mechanics. I thought I knew my physics back from Pilani. Mm -hmm. Later on, we will come to the education system, but this quantum mechanics course was very tough on me. I got 33 out of 100 in the first midterm, so I dropped it <laughs> on the advice of my advisor. I, part of the problem was I had never seen a TV in India. 
and summer olympics were still taking place in mexico okay. so come home from the stanford and just watch olympics i neglected uh, all the homework assignments because at the time in uh, in bits uh, homework had uh, they were not counted towards your final grade mm-hmm. right. at stanford they counted for something like 30% of the final grade so, uh, having not done uh, too much homework i got out of the remaining four courses i got two a's and two b's <laughs> I learned that this system is very different and after uh, starting with the second quarter I never got a B again uh I also learned how to balance the life mm-hmm. uh so went to TI and that TI actually I got paid to learn I appreciated the value of actual experimental work rather than just theory. Okay. I was a product engineer in TI but they would not allow me to be in the research. Okay. For research you needed a PhD. Okay. So I was just producing the first ever uh, solid state radar which was being built but my my job was a production engineer. Okay. So that decided me to go back to Stanford. Uh my advisor Jim Mindel was a great guy. He gave me lots of freedom uh within some constraints. Mm-hmm. And I uh he put me in a group which was working on a reading aid for the blind. Uh till then uh blind people had to resort to other means of reading a book mm-hmm. yeah. but uh in this project we were building uh, optical to tactile conversion and my part was developing high voltage mos transistors but jim mindel gave me a lot of freedom and i sailed through in my phd in three and a half years <laughs> wow That's uh amazing. I think yeah. uh, with lots of help from uh, my advisor of course okay. but during that time I got involved in sports both watching and playing uh, I learned how to play tennis Stanford was the number one team in tennis right. uh, I got coaching you could take lessons uh, I, I'm not sure in bits they get credit for taking sports but I got Mm-hmm. uh one unit uh, credit for taking tennis as a course yeah and watching football the american football yeah. so i uh, that also taught me how to balance life between academics and uh, other parts of life yeah. uh so so that was uh, the story of my phd days So but after phd you continue to stay back in academia right so did you ever want to return to the industry during this period after that i was going to go back to ti they wanted me back now that i had a phd but jim mindel said well why don't you stay back and they were starting a program on developing computer models for uh, semiconductor fabrication technology uh, i said would you like to stay as a postdoc Yeah. I said great so I never uh, left Stanford stayed there as a postdoc for a few years it was a very interesting program because till then uh, semiconductor manufacturing was mostly through experimentation okay uh, there were no computer uh, uh, models or computer aided design techniques but that program led to the first ever computer program called supreme okay which is still uh-huh. used by the industry uh, till today mm-hmm. that's amazing so i mean that's a nice segue into the next question but you just told us that you sailed through your phd in three and a half years but <laughs> there was any point which was even mildly challenging and how did you deal with that i don't remember uh if there was something really challenging Uh, which uh, impacted me negatively uh i was 
I had a pretty balanced life. Uh, work while work, play while play, uh, as I just mentioned. And I just don't remember any any time I was in any kind of trouble, both uh, academically or professionally or mentally yeah. Yeah. in any way. Nice. But like now the research culture, for instance, there's this continuous pressure to publish. And you know, it's <laughs> a weird cycle where, you know, you, you are expected to join a PhD program where you learn to do research. But then before you join itself, people now check if you already have some research experience. So a lot of students are stuck in this, in this, in this cycle where, you know, they want to learn how to do research. But in order to do that, you already have to have some paper or some publication. And there are, you know, that, that makes it a little harder for people to then choose to do a PhD eventually. So how, do you, how would you address this today? So it's true, yeah. I, first of all, I don't look at what a person knows. Mm -hmm. So the knowledge is not very important. It is, are you capable of uh, getting knowledge? Do you have the capabilities? So that's the one thing I really look for in my students. Mm -hmm. So they need not be a 4 or a GPA. The American system is four point, if you remember. So for, uh, uh, even if they have 4.3 out of four, the A plus gets uh, more credit. What I look for is given a problem, can they solve it? Yeah. And to solve, they can go read papers, attend a bunch of courses, uh, develop that background. So many of my students have been non-electrical engineers. I have had students from mechanical engineering, from uh, chemistry, from uh, material science, uh, etc. They were able to learn and they had the ability to learn. So that's what I look for. Uh, I choose the best students with that capability and then give them lots of freedom as did my advisor during my PhD day. Yeah. And I don't put undue pressure on them according to my guidelines. Mm -hmm. I advise them to work on problems with real applications, right. which is my motto of the research. Right. Right. At the same time, I advise them to have a balanced life because balanced life is extremely important. Mm -hmm. Go watch a football game or uh, go see a musical or attend a concert or something because that keeps little balance in the life. So my students are extremely happy with me <laughs> that uh, I, I don't dictate to them that you got to do this, do that and so on. Yeah. And I've had a lot of success in uh, churning out uh, good students. My very first PhD student is the president of MIT, <laughs> <laughs> Rafael Reif. Uh, I, I, uh, I have a bunch of very good students. Navkant Bhatt is a pretty senior guy at IISC Bangalore, was my student. Okay. So I have my students all over. A dean of uh, UC Berkeley uh, is a, uh, a, a woman, uh, Sujay King. She was my student and, and so on. So uh, I, I, I've been pretty successful in cranking out good students. That sounds really, really good and very, very positive. Um, amazing, I think. Yeah, so now moving a little ahead, let's talk about your research interests. So currently, as far as we understood, you in, you research about new and innovative materials and structures and process technology of um, semiconductors. And you also look at scalability of nanoelectronics. And additionally, you're also the recipient of a prestigious IEEE Andrew S. Grove Award. So can you give us some more insights about your research in Tell us what it is all about and what, what are you focusing on? First of all, the award I really cherish is the BITS alum award. <laughs> <laughs> when they started it, I think either the very first year or maybe the second year I was given that. So I, unfortunately, I'm doing this from my home because I, I'm not allowed to enter my office for, for a while till this COVID uh, is, a, is a problem. So I don't have that here. I display that in my office. Uh, but yeah, I, I Grove Award is, is a great award. Uh, I believe in 
uh, 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 that a good researcher becomes stale by remaining in the same exact field forever. Mm-hmm. It is best to recognize what are the future challenges and accordingly change the direction of the research. I also don't believe in esoteric and pedantic research. It should have some definite application in mind, uh, even if it is very futuristic. Mm -hmm. This is what has driven me throughout my career. I can take a minute to describe as to how I kept changing every decade or so. So as I told you, my thesis was on reading it uh, for the blind, the, the high voltage MOSFETs. Yeah. Upon graduation, I worked on computer modeling of uh, fabrication technology. Mm-hmm. But by uh, late 70s, I realized well ahead of the time that the performance of the electronic chips mm-hmm. will be limited by signal transmissions on the wires or the interconnected uh, not that much on transistors. So I shifted my uh, emphasis on uh, interconnects. In mid 80s, I realized that USA was losing the race in manufacturing of semiconductors to Japan at the time, not, not to China. At that time, it was Japan. Okay. So I shifted that area and I collab- collaborated my previous company, Texas Instruments, to go from batch fabrication to single wafer manufacturing and the tools which could be used for that. So uh, real-time sensing and control. That has become the industry standard now. Mm-hmm. By mid-90s, I realized that the Moore's law is in jeopardy. So I came back to devices in the newer materials like germanium, carbon nanotubes, transition metal, dichalcogenides, and their applications to not only electronic devices, but photonic interconnects Mm -hmm. and uh, three-dimensional integration. Uh, Lately, realizing that Mother Earth is in trouble, I have also started working on uh, uh, how to improve the efficiency and reduce the co- cost of uh, solar cells. So that's a long answer to your short question. <laughs> no, but it just shows that you've always tried to keep up with the area and the relevant problems, right? At each decade, yeah. they keep shifting. So, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a great segue. So where do you see this industry moving in the next five to 10 years? Like, do you see another major revolution that's right around the corner? Like, how is, according to you, how do you see this moving? Transition yes. Revolution, right? Do you see something of that degree, mm-hmm. like, coming soon? Yeah. So, in the last half a century, the emphasis was on computing. Mm-hmm. From computing, it went to communications. Okay. Uh, and for a long time, we have seen these uh, cell phones and internet, etc. They have uh, fueled the revolution in the industry, not just electronics, but the entire industry. Although electronics has led the way. Going in future, uh, we see other areas emerging where the applications will be more important which include healthcare, clean energy, environment, artificial intelligence, mm-hmm. uh, education. Education mm-hmm. used to be just a classroom. It's uh, uh, changing. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, the research was bottoms up. That we will invent a new device and somebody will find an application. Right. That's not happening anymore. Now it stops down that this is what I want go find me a device or a technology which can do that. So from bottoms up to tops down, more system level orientation rather than uh, device and technology uh, orientation. And that's happening in all fields. Uh, Although there is a craze for artificial intelligence and computer science right now, but to fuel that you still need systems which can do uh, justification for that. Communication still is uh, very important, especially in this uh, uh, this particular time of coronavirus. It has become extremely important. Mm-hmm. So that that's my take on where the future uh, innovations are coming. Right. 
I love the analogy of the whole shift from bottom up to top down approach. I think that's that's so true. We see it. <laughs> and I left left out one area: entertainment. <laughs> so that's gaining more and more importance. Sitting home here, you know, all you do is spend time of uh, on either computer or on the TV. <laughs> so now changing gears a little bit. So. life of a researcher as we know is not a 9 to 5 job it goes well beyond that and you know you always have to think of new problems something on the others always playing at the back of your head <laughs> um so and and this can get taxing sometimes so what was the role of your family in keeping you grounded keeping you sane during these very taxing routines and also how did they keep you motivated in research in general so my wife had a, a, a big role in that uh, she had been a great support to me through thick and thin and while i was busy at work she spent lots of time taking care of uh, the family mm-hmm. but i all, always had time for my family i made sure that i spent uh, enough time with the kids uh we are a very travel oriented family we have been to almost all corners of uh, uh world but with children i took my okay. kids to brazil when they were 3 and 5 year old <laughs> <laughs> think of that and elsewhere i also gave full freedom uh, to my kids to choose their profession their lifestyle their wives uh uh so happened they did become engineers <laughs> uh but not my kind of engineer my, uh, my elder son uh, uh did computer science and is works for gaming industry uh, my younger son did material science but then did an mba and he is a venture capital uh, guy now so uh uh but we are a close knit family uh very happy uh, I, i i again i made sure that i spend enough time and take care of the needs of uh, my children and my wife mm-hmm. but again hats uh, hats off to my wife who has been a great support nice that's that's really good to hear <laughs> yeah let's move on to the final segment this is a surprise we 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 hadn't announced it uh, before so it's the rapid fire round where the questions would have relatively short answers and quick responses so okay let's... okay um it would like te- 5 to 10 seconds for you to give an answer that's it okay okay all right uh, now you want to start yeah. okay so what was the biggest milestone that you achieved according to you in life so far uh raising a very balanced uh, family okay. okay one incident where you broke a rule and got away with it during your college or grad school days i got drunk a couple of times <laughs> <laughs> twice twice <laughs> right and i learned that there was uh, as a student Yeah, yeah, and then I learned never to get drunk. During <laughs> <laughs> okay. your first years as an advisor, um, you know, when you first became an advisor and you first few students, was there any particular funny incident where you know you messed up given the inexperience that you had in handling students before that? Like any fun thing in the transition from student to now teacher? Uh, in the beginning, I encouraged them to work very hard. only later in my life that i said g you have to have a balanced life <laughs> okay right. okay so are you a beer coffee tea or a wine person red wine all the way ah nice. <laughs> okay so nice. what was your favorite spot at bits and what is your favorite spot in stanford at bits it was uh, cricket at stanford it's uh, uh playing tennis and watching football okay all right okay ahana do you want to take the next question as well a uh, yeah. final question or well, this is on popular demand uh, do you have any book recommendations like one of your favorite 
books uh, in terms of like which which really inspired you in some way uh my higher secondary english textbook was oliver twist okay how this guy from being an orphan uh, spent a life and and uh, uh became a, 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 a pretty good kid it, uh, so that was one okay there's one more book if i can say yeah jawaharlal nehru wrote a book discovery of india okay yeah. that was uh, uh a very nice book okay great uh, that was the end of the rapid fire just to talk to you and get to know you a little bit more as a person as opposed to the researcher only that we knew from reading about you and and seeing all your research work online um so we wanted some parting thoughts uh given that you know you're such a senior researcher now at stanford and also professor uh we wanted to get to know a little bit more about you know um your uh, opinion and uh, you know experience on how the education system differs uh from you know india and and the us both college and so that that's a million dollar question very important <laughs> in my time and i believe still uh indian system works more on knowing the facts and figures and memorizing them and using your memory for uh whatever comes in life later on us system is much more solving problems it's more project oriented and solving problems in almost all courses i teach i don't have a final exam i give them a project all right in one course uh, i have it i give it to a team of uh, six uh, of them and eventually everybody is going to get the same grade right, right. Uh, because it's teamwork in another course i ask them to give a presentation and then for a very futuristic uh, application yeah. so indian uh, education system still relies on uh, memorization and i think th- uh, they need to make some changes yeah i think so we we had the national education policy in fact just 3 days right recently back, yeah uh, national education policy 2020 was released where they came up with a new set of guidelines now that they will be uh, implementing for all grades i think first the major change which i was really happy to see was the shifting from the 10 plus 2 system uh to a 5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4 which is similar to i think the system in in the us and yeah. also they're focusing more on experiential learning as they call it so kids from 6th grade onwards will be encouraged to do internships now from the very beginning so that's the, great yeah the the new education policy is pretty pretty good but i really hope that the implementation is just as good <laughs> so that i hope so yeah right yeah. so moving on i am an electric i mean i'm from an electronics background as well and now i'm in a complete different uh, field i've moved towards finance and taxation so you know looking at so looking did, back so did my son <laughs> <laughs> right that's it. looking back at my class from bits i mean the attrition rate in the field of electronics and electrical engineering especially from where i've seen is quite large after college so people tend to move towards different a different field so during uh, the joining uh, of bits like when i joined our branch is the maximum like majority of population like electronics electrical and communications together at the majority and i saw a lot of us move into finances management it so what would you think according to your potential changes that you could suggest to rectify this situation it all goes back to the reward system Yeah. when my elder brother uh, got into engineering he chose civil engineering because india was booming in construction yeah. in uh, 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 you know uh, 60 years ago mm-hmm. uh, very quickly i should say quickly by the time i got into college mechanical engineering was the number one field again because of job situations Mm-hmm. people told me you chose electronics you will take a soldering rod and go in the streets radio theek karwa lo 
So uh, fast forward, uh, electronics has uh, become the most interesting area. Uh, for, uh, it uh, was till recently when computer science has overtaken, uh, uh, especially AI. Mm -hmm. So it goes back to the reward system where, where you have the potential of becoming very successful. Currently, even in uh, this country, as I told you, my younger son, he worked for about six years in various uh, companies, uh, solar cell company, this and that and so on. Went back to the uh, business school, got an MBA, and now he uh, works in a venture capital firm because the rewards are great there. Mm -hmm. So uh, unless uh, we make changes there, uh this is not going to change and there are some people uh, tell me you are an idiot you stayed back and uh, as a professor you could have really started a new company well i had the passion so okay. unless you have the passion you just go for where you make uh, uh, you get the best rewards and I think when you talk about the passion, frankly, from personal, from personal experience during college, I did try to find a area of passion in electronics. So we did projects and all, but I think it was missing um, even from the teaching perspective from like, at least from where we did a lot of them. There were very few really passionate professors who could, you know, in, imbibe that in students. So that, yeah, for me personally, I think that was one point which made me look for other fields as well, like eventually. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. so I think go ahead. Back to that, uh, yeah, and and we could see this clear distinction between the computer science uh, courses and the electronics courses. So in computer science, like even friends who weren't in the computing uh, area, like branch wise, they would come and sit in our classes just yeah. because the teaching was so. Um, engaging and the projects were so engaging but yeah this was this was definitely lacking i think when we were there yeah it also yeah good teachers make a big difference i had very good teachers during my time at wits but but even in the higher secondary school i remember some of the teachers in physics and chemistry they were very nice for every theory course we had a lab yeah. which went away uh, lately uh, not only in bits but in many other places mm -hmm. partly financial so people just go, they mug up and they lose interest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We ha I remember having a really hard time, especially semiconductors, because, you know, I, I, I had this huge book where I, for me, I really like it when I can understand right from the basics, right from exactly what is going on and then build it up. So every time I start with the book, I go like somewhere halfway through and I lose track and then again I start. <laughs> So Hana would come and then she like, you know, she always saw me reading that one huge book. So yeah. it pays to have good uh, teachers who can inspire you. Right, definitely. I think Harsha is here now. He's also, he's currently studying at this. Just... Yeah. And he's also from the electronics. He's studying, he's studying in electronics and communications. Good. Harsh Vardhan, that's a very historical name. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Harsha. Yes, yes. Hello, welcome to the party. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, sir. So you had a question for sir? Yeah, sir. I'm second year is done, sir. EC. When I joined engineering, I was like, just the plus two. I like, like a lot of electronics, so I like the stuff. I joined. But like, as I'm doing it now, it's like more like what uh, why am I learning? It's like it's, I'm kind of losing that interest. So, so what would you suggest to maintain that excitement so when it comes to electronics? So, in in my opinion, electronics is the backbone of the entire industry. Whether it is aeronautics, mechanical engineering, uh, aerospace civil engineering, environmental engineering, everywhere there is some application of electronics. So what you should do is look at uh, applications 
as to where the future is, uh, we are sitting right now communicating with each other using the tools provided by electronics, whether it's a communication or uh, a microphone or uh, a camera or whatever. In every domain, electronics is becoming pervasive. Now, electronics combined with uh, uh, computer science. So those are the two most popular fields here at Stanford. In fact, we Stanford is a very uh, well-rounded university and we fear that more and more we are uh, uh, paying too much attention to uh, those two areas and neglecting the, the other non-engineering or non-science areas. So there is lots of discussion on that, but find those applications which tickle your fancy rather than just reading books or papers. Yeah. And then you will be motivated. It could be in biomedicine, it could be in energy, it could be in uh, a communication. In any of those areas, find something which uh, tickles your fancy. Okay. Thank you, sir. So now to like conclude, I mean, we can't ignore the present situation in the world, which is COVID and the whole pandemic that's come upon us. Um, so how do you see the culture uh, changing in universities and companies post COVID, given the situation now? So I think COVID, the impact of COVID be there uh, at least for one more year. The, uh, the vaccine should be there sometimes next year. Mm -hmm. But during this time, this isolation has changed our way of lives. We sit at home, we work from home, we communicate using computers, uh, we don't shake hands, uh, we, we don't uh, have uh, nights out or go to a restaurant. So that is changing the way of life. And this will continue for a while. Uh, so the, uh, social environment will change. Also, I think people are sticking closer to their families, uh, which is a welcome change. <laughs> uh, in terms of academia, I think th there's going to be a big change. At least I can talk about uh, the universities in this country uh, where I, I have more experience. So there are top rated universities like MIT, Berkeley, Stanford, Caltech, et cetera, where the graduate education, the PhD education is at least equally uh, important as undergrad. And part of it is huge experimental facilities. Okay. So those universities, the, the rich keeps getting richer. Yeah. Uh, there will be haves and have nots. So the second tier universities will start focusing more on classroom education. And the classroom education for a while at least will be conducted using internet. Mm -hmm. they, the so second tier universities will not have means to uh, keep doing uh, uh, academic research. So that would be the impact on uh, education, I think. Uh, but I think by 22 or so when the when we have vaccine just like in the past we had about the plague and this and that and so on life should return back to normal i hope okay. great i think it was so so i mean very very warm and nice talking to you i mean it's really really pleasant <laughs> Uh, thank you so much. Likewise. And it was really, really nice to see someone who, who is so passionate about electronics. <laughs> I really feel my voice going down. And even as a researcher, it's good to know that, you know, it is possible to have a balanced life. Uh, you, you better have that. If you don't have balanced life, uh, there are problems. Right. So you, I, I absolutely force my students to get out of the lab or get out of their office, go do something, do a jog or go to the gym or uh, uh, play tennis or, or at least watch uh, football or something. Yeah. 
and they are quite happy uh, with that. They may take another three months or six months extra to finish their uh, PhD, but their life will be very well balanced. Right. Thank you so much, Thank sir. You so much, sir. So before we end, uh, we'd like you to sign off quite literally. Like so. Uh, so my name is Krishna Saraswat. Roll number three sixty five. Graduated in nineteen sixty eight. Signing off. Thank you. Yeah. Very welcome. Thank, Thank you so, so much, sir. It was an absolute pleasure talking to you. It was uh, pleasure was mine to see such bright minds and cheerful. <laughs> <laughs> it was so lovely talking to someone who is so passionate about electronics and at the same time enjoys the small pleasures of life with as much vigor. Today, we also got some insights into the state of the art in the field of electronics and some interesting takes on the education system in general. We hope you enjoyed this episode as much as we did. If so, please do comment below and let us know if you have any suggestions. And as always, please do like, share and subscribe. We'll be back again next week with another interesting episode. Till then, stay home, stay safe.